day 23. We had to carry the beetle down the stairs, just like the old alien days. Me at one end, Mandy on the other. Mandy was on the feet. I kept dropping him, of course. Or so Mandy kept telling me. What are you on, Scribble? I'm on the head, what are you on? Very funny. Behind us were Twinkle and Carly. Behind them was Tristan, carrying the body of Suze. Her long strands of hair, falling free at last from the lover's knot. He had some bad things in his brain. You could see them moving. We laid the beetle out on the pavement, and the rest of the group was standing around, all of them looking at me, as though I was the warrior. Shit, man. Maybe I just can't handle this. You got somewhere for the Sous to lie? asked Tristan. His face was dripping sweat in the night, from the weight, from the tenderness. Yeah, I got somewhere. Not sure. Nor was the beetle. He ain't got a fuck all, hissed the beetle. Babe's a failure. I'll tell you something, Tristan. Kid sure ain't no stash rider. Well, fuck you, B. Who's in charge round here? I am. With that, I took off up the street towards a van I'd spotted. I was full up with hate. Hate for the bee. Hate for the job. Hate for the loss and the failure. Hate for failing Desdemona and Bridget and the Thing and all the others that were waiting. Those I'd yet to fail but would surely do so when the crack came round. That was when I felt it. The flash. Sudden image. Me, riding in a stolen murk, doing a wheel twist round a corner, not giving a shit, putting deliberate dents in posh parked cars. I was in Baby Racer. I was right on in there, driving, totally feathered up, living on the dub side. The hatred had fired me, jump-started me. I vazed open the van hood, disconnected the alarm system. How the fuck did I do that? I opened the back door, and Twinkle and the dog were first on board, first cargo. I lodged Beetle's head on the floor rim, then stepped into the back myself, helping to pull his limp shape inside. Mandy steering the rudder of his legs, she climbed in after him. Beetle made some noises all during this, but I had the shades down. I was climbing back out when Mandy called me over. Scribble. The beetle, his wound. Look. There were worms glowing in there, and turning into colours. All the colours you could name. Never mind the beetle just now. You know we got some work to do. What's wrong with you people? cried the beetle. I'm feeling top-notch. I'm on the case. Just a little pain, that's all. I climbed back out of the van to where Tristan was waiting, Sue's in his arms. We worked a gentle body into the van. It was like some kind of ceremony. Tristan followed us, stepping high but sluggish. They were all in. Keep the faith. That's what I said. I don't know why. Just said it. Keep the faith. I drove. My hands, instruments of vert... I parked the van some few feet away from the original space where the old van, the stashmobile, had found our last resting place. Heavy tyres crunching glass as we came to rest. I heard the back door opening. Seconds later, Tristan appeared at my window. I wound it down, letting his sad-eyed face come close. I'm going to sort some things out, he said. Yeah, sure. You all right? I'm fine, fine. Just keep looking after Suze. It's done. Then he was away, striding out into the darkness. I watched him disappear into the stairwell. A kind of loneliness closed in all around me. Through the windscreen, I watched Bottletown go into bed. Light by light, all along the crescent, lights were going out one by one. It seemed like some kind of mystic code was being played out there on the high rises until only the fat moon was left glistening. B called from the back. Are we doing anything, Scribble? Sure be. We're doing a daily crossword. Now everyone shut the fuck up. Everybody shut the fuck up. Even the beetle. We were waiting on something. Each of us. In the moments before the rain. Tristan had been gone half an hour. What the fuck was he doing up there? The first wet spots hit the screen. Big, hot coins of it. Splattering the glass. I stepped out of the van and the rain felt so good against me skin. I just wanted to shout out loud. I walked over to where the first van had been fired. The ground was well crushed with glass. Tufts of dog fur were caught on the shards of glass and something had painted the words Das Uber Dog on the pavement. My feet were getting cut. My ankle was aching again. So I rolled up my jean leg to see the wound dripping. 
like those tiny holes were reopening. Tristan still wasn't back yet. I could hear Beetle crying out in pain from the back of the van, but I just paid him no mind, shades down, other problems. The black rain was dripping from me eyelids, into me line of sight forming a beaded curtain. I hear a noise over to me right and I turn to see a man walking towards me. At first I think he's a bad guy. He looks that mean. Then I see the dogs coming, two of them, leashed to one of his hands. Over one shoulder he carries a shotgun, over the other a canvas bag, in his other hand a spade. And as the stranger approaches, other details fall into place, the smears of paint on his face, in stripes, the look in his eyes, a look of pure momentum like an animal. He takes those last few steps, the ones that bring us near to each other, the difficult steps. I see then his bald head, shining in the moonlight, jabs of colour here and there, bits of blood it looks like. Tristan? Is that you? The stranger doesn't answer me. What you done, man? Where's the hair? Shaved it. The two dogs were straining to be set free, howling towards the moon, feeling their blood pulled in waves by its gravity. Tristan's not looking at the moon. He's not looking at the stars, or at the flats, or the van. Tristan's looking at me. I'm his sole intention. You know what I want, Scribble? Yeah? What we all want. A glass of fetish. Clean drugs. Good friends. A hot partner. All that. Something more. A squaring of the tides. Sneak preview. I'm getting word of a new theatre. Hasn't got a name yet. Working title is Bootleg Dreams. I've met the hero figure. His name is Scratch. And he tells a well, wicked story. This is how it starts. Wendy comes out of the all-night vert you want, clutching a bag of goodies. You're a member of this gang of young, hip, malcontents. They call themselves the Crash Drivers, so that's what I'm calling this new feather trip. This is one yellow shining journey. Gold and yellow. It's a hard life. And most probably you're going to die in this crazy yellow. Be very, very careful. This ride is not for the weak. It's a psycho. A bit like real life. Well, maybe not quite that bad. Some bad things buried out on the moors. Some good things as well. Some innocent things. Some things that didn't want to get buried. Some that did. Some that got buried by accident. By snowfall, or rockfall, or soil slippage. Some that buried themselves, wanting the darkness to fall over their all-seeing eyes. Plenty get buried there, out on the moors. It's where you go when you come from Manchester. And you want to bury get buried or be buried on the way through the night we talked about the wound the way it was turning spiraling out from its point of entry coming in colors like a rainbow crumbling at the edges in paisley shapes some change was coming over the beetle and it was making him ramble i'm on a spree i like it like this hey scrib you see me new colors sure be looking good i took another glance back and the colours were glowing, spreading out from Beetle's shoulder, taking charge of him, reaching almost to his elbow on one side, to the back of his neck on the other. Mandy was cradling his head in her palms. The dark air of the van suffused into a soft aura round his body. I turned back to the road and the driving. Didn't really know where we were going, just knew we were getting there. Tristan was saying, I think it's bad, B. Extremely. Shit, don't scare me, man, it feels good. The pain's drifting away. You get that, Trist? No fucking pain. Listen to me. We were listening. Tristan spoke like he didn't want B to hear. You know what that means? It's a Mandel bullet. Murdoch's got him. Jesus. Does it have to be like this? No one escapes it, Scrib. 
Once bitten, the worm just keeps on growing, spreading, multiplying. You can't stop it. No way. He's going fractal. It's a slow death. Oh, don't say that, please. Don't say that. There's no antidote, Scrib. Mandel bullets were designed to take advantage of the near miss, the wound in shot. Within 24 hours, 48 at the most, the virus in the bullet has taken over the entire metabolism. You're dead. And how? The deepest cut was that those last 24 hours of your life were going to be the best you'd ever lived, as the fractals lit up like a rainbow, giving you visions of glory. And that was why the beetle was singing now, his mind taking over, singing the praises of life. Even in the midst of death, singing praises. You've been talking to my brother, Tristan said, calling me down. I saw him there, at the slidey tove. The game cat? You saw him? Oh yes, I can see him. When Geoffrey wants me to see, that is. Geoffrey? Yeah, his real name. The cat's best kept secret. Call him Geoffrey next time. He must probably kill you. He said that he felt for you, that he... Tristan exploded. That man should stay out of my life. That fucker only brings grief. Sure, sure, whatever, Trist. We drove forward in silence for a few minutes. It happened years ago, Tristan said, when we were both young, me younger than him, but both of us hooked on the feathers. One day he found a yellow, our first yellow, Takshaka. Jeffrey got bitten. Takshaka himself, the king of the snakes, sank two fangs into his arm. I should have killed him. Jeffrey took it on board, worshipped the wound, fed it on bones and flesh. I think he fell in love with the poison inside him, and it fell in love with him. My brother got addicted then, craving more, and he found curious yellow. Was this inside English voodoo? Yes. He forced me into doing it. And I came down alone. I think... I think he preferred it there. I let him be for a while. But something was nagging at me. The cat was taken into vert. But he must have been swapped. That's how it works. Exchange rates. Tristan took his time in answering. I came round in our living room. No, I wasn't alone. There was a woman beside me. A girl, actually. Because this was years ago. Her embrace was powerful, and I gave back the same. She was lovely. That was years ago. This was Susie. Tristan nodded. Suze was a vert being. An alien. Just like the thing, but one thousand times more beautiful. Tristan was crying. Oh, God, Scribble. What am I going to do? Susie... There are no words to add. You can't help that kind of pain. You can only make it worse or bury it. We'd left the trees behind, and the night opened up into a black expanse of moorland. Even the skies were crying now, a dark fall of tears against the windscreen. This is the place, Tristan said. It was a shallow grave, because that was all that Tristan could manage. "'scraping away with his thin shovel against the layers of dirt. "'All around our circle shadows were dancing. "'The rain was turning the earth into mud, and Tristan was struggling. "'I tried to help, we all had, but Tristan had pushed us away. "'We watched as he lowered Suze into the shallow grave. "'Then he opened the canvas bag and took out the thick tresses of his hair. "'Then he let them fall into the earth so that they landed softly on her body.' He took a small wooden box from the bag and placed this also with the body. All of us gathered round the grave, silent, our minds full up of want. Tristan had the two grown-up dogs on a double lead. I could see his fingers starting to slip. What are you doing? I'm letting them go. We may need them. No, no, not at all. We're doing this alone. Susie wants it like this. I'm keeping Carly, said Twinkle. Tristan nodded. So I'm watching the two dogs disappearing into the darkness. Twinkle's fingers were tight on Carly's collar, pulling her back from the urge. Tristan's shaved head was splattered with raindrops, but his eyes were dry, focused, tight. 
I could feel a need coming off him. The dancing crowd crush could just fuck off. That look on Dingo's face when he realised. Just fuck off, you dancing fools, because I was there, with both hands round the grip, two sweaty hands, one finger dry on the trigger. Dingo didn't even know yet, didn't even know yet that a gun was pointing at him. The Tush Dog fans were dancing. I'd squeezed my way amongst them into the pit, close to the stage, covered in sweat and dog breath. It was bad, but close enough to see his eyes as he sang, and that was all I wanted. I just wanted to see his eyes as he saw me there. Then he caught a glimpse of metal from the crowd. You ever been on the wrong end of a gun? Feels like a tunnel is about to open up and you're going to get sucked in and there's nothing you can do about it. There's just nothing you can do. Dog music spluttering to a close. The dingo hooked on the thing in me hands. You know what I'm after, dingo, I called. Dingo Tush, the super dog. The high barking king of dog pop. Well, just take a look, loyal fans. See how he shakes now. Above Dingo's head, a sad mirror ball spun, flinging out lines of light like a broken halo. It was just gone five in the morning. Dingo Tush was playing an all-nighter in the flesh pot, a low-life dog trucker's stopover down by the canal side, storming through a rush of music, big hits, planet samples, cover versions, all done up in hardware beats. But now the music stops. Now the music fucking stops, Dogstar. Dingo tried to move. I held the gun steady, but inside I was sweating heaven out from me paws, thinking, shit, I've never fired a gun before. Please, Lord, don't let me hurt anybody. And then with a black jolt, I was in gun stroker. A well black feather. But I was there featherless. Don't move, dog man. You know what I'm looking for. Dingo's eyes were darting to and fro, looking for escape routes. And then he latched onto some movement out in the crowd, and his fangs broke through as he smiled. I didn't dare risk even a sideways glance, but I guess someone had called the bouncers, and now they were moving in, so it was comforting to find Tristan at me side, his shotgun primed and heavy, and then Twinkle moving up close, her little hands straining on Carly's lead. Carly was a brutal, handsome devil by now, and she did as proud, a fine show of daggered teeth and foaming jaw slush. And then Mandy pushed through the crowd, leading the beetle by the hand. His colours shone out, loud and proud from his spreading wound. I guess the bouncers saw the way it was going. Nobody was bothering us. The crowd was showing a suitable hush. Somebody screamed, then went quiet, sudden-like, as though someone else had jabbed her in the ribs. I was pleased with the effect I was having. It felt like release. Dingo shouted down, what are you after? Brid and the thing. How would I know? Dog fucker, tell me where. I could see a few seconds of resistance in his eyes as he contemplated his denial, but I had the gun and he didn't. I guess it makes some kind of difference. Cosmic debris. No games, Dingo, the address. That's the lot, pure boy. I pulled on the trigger. Just a little, mind. Just a tiny gun stroke a squeeze, enough to activate the red firing light, enough to get the crowd gasping and the dingo to start screaming and to end the screaming with the blurted out message, the address. I eased the trigger back into safety mode, the red light fade into cool mode. Stash riders, out of here. I was kind of loving this. Outside, into the swirl. At the Fleshpot Canal down by the Old Trafford docks, dozens of boats were tied up along the bank. The floating families selling off stuff, just to make a small life. Some were selling food from barbecue boats. Some were selling love. The down market version, cheap sluts and rabid studs on deck, and a boat of flowers, a floating garden. I was heading for the back door of the van, ready to let the crew in, but I was getting this bad feeling like there was something wrong with the number plate or something wrong with my eyes. I couldn't fathom it. Something wrong. I was staring at the number plate, and the numbers were flickering, like they were living numbers. Couldn't work it out. Then I got it. Shadow Cop. There was a beam of info firing onto the number plate. I looked around, and there was Shaka working his mechanisms. What now, big leader man? 
Stash riders, let's move. I was running through the crowd, away from the van, forcing a path, people yelling out at me, but I wasn't listening, just running on, didn't know where to run to. I was looking all ways, searching for a way out. Cop sirens were playing me all-time least favourite tune. I caught a broken shadow dancing along the edge of my vision. I turned to get that image fixed. There was the shacker, floating over the market, with the she-cop, Murdoch, close behind, gun in hand. Man, I was getting some serious vipers in me system. Then a voice over by the boats. Crew cut! This way! Relish it! I was searching for the voice. The needling voice in the boat stack. Then my eyes were following the sound to its likely source, finding the sign on the masthead. Chef Barney. I ran towards the boat, dragging the posse on. Chef Barney was on deck, waving us aboard. We clambered onto the swaying vessel, and I was almost certain I'd brought everybody with me. Twinkle? Yeah. Carly with her? Yeah. Mandy? Yeah. B? Yeah. Tristan. Tristan? You there, me friend? Seems not. Chef Barney cut the line. Wait! I called. But I called it late. Way too late. And as we were drifting away, I watched the Tristan stepping out from the crowd, his gun lodged in his arms, firm and solid. Tristan! Guy took no notice. He had the sheik up in his sights. And he wanted payment, payment for the loss. Tristan let loose that shotgun. It made a pretty flame in the morning's light. Murdoch dived behind the body of a family saloon, away from the fire. Other cops were coming in. Tristan was jiggling the gun mechanism, ready for another shot. Too late. Too slow. I was catching all this from the widening water. The cops were beating down on Tristan with spikes. All I could do was watch. I turned my eyes away. Barney was there at the helm, wheel in hand. Where are you taking us, chef? Home. Home? Where's that, then? And the river was a vein of blood under the sun. Eyes opening to a flicker. Colours, shapes of faces, people laughing. The television was on. I'm sitting in a deep velvet armchair in the corner of a small living room, watching through half-open eyes. The television was a matte black model with chrome trim, a real collector's item. The kids down on the rug were screaming with joy, the dog's tail wagging. The living room door opened and Barney came into the room. He was followed by a woman. She was carrying a tray of food and Barney had a bottle of wine and some glasses. The woman's hair was green, emerald green. She put the tray down for me on a small glass coffee table. The food went with the room. Plates of meat and fish, spiced vegetables, crispy salads, ginger and garlic pastes, fruit and nuts, crumbling cheeses, apple pie with a cinnamon custard. Chef Barney smiled. You awake now, crew cut? You were out cold. All of you were. Where's Beetle? Beetle's in the bedroom. This is our home and this is me wife, Lucinda. She smiled. She had a perfect face. So did Barney. They were all smiles. The room where they lived was a hive of comfort. The room was drenched in age-old colours. And it suddenly came to me. This isn't real. It's just not real. Barney smiled, proud of it. That's right. This is what I am. He lifted up his arm to me. And with the other hand, he peeled off a section of the flesh... Showing me the workings underneath. Nano germs popping along the veins of his blood, the synthetic bones flexing. Robo! Barney was a robo! A robo chef! He tapped his tight skull. Inside here are all the best recipes of all the best chefs in this world. I am their depository. This is Roboville, crew. I think the pure call it Toy Town, isn't that right? Lucinda spoke. Don't let Barney scare you. But it was too late for that. I was almost retching. The robo-man took a step towards me. Isn't it funny, the way the pure reacts a robo? You think we were dirty or something, given their reaction? I didn't know about that. Only that I had to get some distance between us, back to where Shadow and Thing were waiting. Tell me the way out of here. I've got something to do. I don't think that's possible, said Barney. Beetle's in a bad way. Lucinda shook her head. He isn't that pure. 
Was she referring to me or a beetle? There were chains and handcuffs arranged along the walls of the bedroom. A collection of whips lay spread out on a bedside cabinet. Beetle was strapped to the bed with six strong tethers. He was flat on his back, and the colours were pouring out of his skin in blades of light. Seemed like half his body was taken over by now, alive with fractals. Scribble, my babe. Good to see you up and about. You're going to loosen these ties a little. I feel like walking some. I guess not. The virus was getting to his mind now, making him feel like a superhero. It's for your own good, B. Don't want you jumping off tall buildings. Yeah, that's me. The shining man. That Barney did a real good job. Hey, maybe he's a bondage freak. Then his voice dropped. I know the final score, kid. That she cop bitch really laid one on me. I guess this is cheerio time. Shit, babe, but I feel good. That's the twister. It does that to you, I said. And his colours were burning on me face. My tears were warm as they trickled down my skin, evaporating in the glare. I know it, Scrib, but you know what else? I feel like going out and stealing back Shadow Girl and the alien. I feel like going out strong in a blaze. His fingers were hot as I clenched my hand around them, feeling the colours shifting freely back and forth between us. But I kept my hand there anyway, taking the heat which was like taking all the spectrums. I was standing by the canal side, drawing breath, watching the water slap listlessly against the stone. It was a turgid, outgoing tide, sweet and rank. Debris bobbed along, not really getting anywhere. One piece looked just like a human forearm. Over the water I could see the opposite bank, where earlier... Some way downstream we'd lost the Tristan to the enemy. Lights were playing faintly there, as some other kinds of people led themselves a normal life. I needed some intake, so I reached into me pocket for me ten-pack of napalms, me fingers falling instead on the soft flight of a feather. I pulled the feather loose and held it up against the moon. It was silver to the very edge. I think the moon was a little jealous because it hid its face behind a ragged cloud. I thought about the game cat. What had he called it? Sniff in general. Just do it. What? Nothing here. I'm... darkness. Nothing here. There's nothing here, for fuck's sake. Darkness. Falling. I'm not here. There's not even me here. Just the thought that I might be here. I think. Well, don't think. No, don't stop thinking. Scribble. Because then even you won't be here anymore. Don't stop thinking. No. Not falling. Floating. In the darkness. Where the fuck am I? You're here. Thinking about here. Keep thinking. But who's doing the thinking for me? You are, Scribble. Darkness. A single star of light up ahead. Where's up? Where's ahead? Where is my head? This is my head. And the star's inside my head. Loading, sniffing, General. Please be patient. Right. Silver star. Just like a cursor. That's it. I'm in a feather. I am a feather. The silver star is scrolling. One, edit. Two, clone. Three, help. Four, door. Five, map. Six, escape. Please select. I'm thinking about the number four. Four for a door. Remember that. Why? Well, just remember it. This option will allow you access through doors between theatres. Please select one blue, two black, three pink, four silver, five life, six cat, seven yellow, eight hobart. Five is alive. 
five is alive. Remember that. I'm thinking about the number seven because of Desdemona. Who? I'm sorry, insufficient coding access. Please reselect. I'm thinking about the number eight. Just for the hell of it. I'm sorry, insufficient coding access. And anyway, Hobart is in a meeting just now. Please reselect and stop wasting my time. I'm thinking about the number six. That's okay. Loading, please hold on. What? Christ. Falling, falling, really falling now, down through layers of darkness, more and more stars in the sky, as I rush through more and more, until the darkness has drained away, and I'm falling through the silverness. A door opening in the silver, through. Sniffing General was sitting at his desk, pushing something round with his paper knife. He was a small man. Not much hair, thick glasses covering his eyes, and he didn't bother to look up as I came into his office. You've got a nerve. I mean, asking to see Hobart, that's ridiculous. He'd finished with the knife now, and he was gazing down at his desk almost lovingly, a line of blue choke powder on a small shaving mirror. There was a door in the wood panelling behind him, fitted out with frosted glass, the words, Game Cat were etched onto a small brass plate fixed just below the glass. Is the game cut in? He rolled up a ten-pound note. I don't like people wasting my time. Do you think I haven't got work to do? Oh, I'm a personal friend of the cat's. That made him look up. He'd already stuck the note up his left nostril. Oh, they all are. They all are. They all claim to know the game cat. None of them do, of course. Tell Geoffrey I'm here. Geoffrey? Yeah, tell him I've come to visit. The sniffing general considered it for a moment and then pressed a button on his desk and whispered into an intercom. I heard the cat answer him from the speaker, but it was all lost in static. Sniffing general seemed to get the gist of it. Game cat will see you now. There's a room in England somewhere, but it's nowhere to be seen. It exists only in the mind and only in the mind of those that have been there. This is where the game cat lives, surrounded by his objects, swapped objects, kitchen sinks and golf clubs, stuffed animals and antique globes, fishing rods and bus tickets, all the paraphernalia of England that the cat has gathered around him, swapped in countless desperate deals from all the people that had come to visit, seeking solace. I was just the latest... Scribble. So nice of you to make it. Gamecat was sitting in a wicker armchair with a balloon glass of deep red wine in his hand. He was wearing a purple smoking jacket and, get this, he had tartan slippers on his feet. You know what I want, Cat? You should drink more wine, Scribble. Oh, I know that fetish is all the rage these days amongst the children, but really, only wine does the job. It certainly eases the pain, my kitling. Ah, oh, how the children love that talk. Give me that fucking yellow. Really, I will not stand for this. Shall I call the general? Do what the fuck you like. Just give me the curious. He will have you removed. It's quite painful, if I remember. Cat, I want curious now. He looked at me. I don't have curious yellow. And there was something in his eyes. Some injury. Maybe he was telling the truth. No, he was lying. Liar! Tristan told me you're hooked on it. He took a sip from his wine glass, like he didn't care. You know where Tristan is, cat. He got captured. I know, yes. I told you to help him, Scribble. I tried. Did you? The cat knew how to hit me. Losing Susie was too much for him, I said. I can imagine. Can you? Yes. I can imagine. I was getting a picture of a man without connections. Someone to whom real life was some kind of hideous prank played by a cruel god. And so from a very early age the vert must have seemed like heaven, like the touch of a strong hand. Tak Shakabite must have seemed like a gift, and the chance of getting lost, getting swapped, was all too much. 
Well, that's quite an interesting theory, Scribble. Doesn't it remind you of somebody? I want Desdemona back. How very poetic. You bastard.